learn a little bit about neurology and neuro instruments, I have three questions for you. Do you know the instrument's names? What are their uses? And what are some different types of instruments? We're going to go over a little bit of the instruments that are involved in neurology. Now, mind you, these are just a small example of these instruments. Uh, this video is going to be a little bit about what's the name of the instruments, what are the uses within surgery for these instruments. If you go ahead and like and subscribe to these videos, it helps me with the algorithm and obviously helps me get this out more to students within YouTube. That being said, let's go ahead and just jump right into those instruments. As you can see here, we have some neurology types of instruments. There's some supplies, but mainly these are instruments in neurology. They could be dealing with um, obviously some issues with the spinal cord, some impingement on that spinal cord. We're going to go over a couple of these instruments on here. This is also for my class that I teach at Southern Technical College. All I ask the student is to be exposed to these instruments. Obviously in externships you're going to have a lot more exposure than you do at the school in a lab situation. Uh, but the, half the battle is just knowing what the name is and having an idea what it's called and have an idea what it's used for. We're going to start over here down yonder with some supplies. Now these are called cotinoids or patties, right? These are very similar. You can look on here. It has a radio peg, which it can show up on x-ray. So a lot of these are sponges per se for neuro. They come in different sizes. As you can see, they come in a 10 pack, right? These are countable items. They come half by half, three by three, many different sizes. Don't confuse these a lot of, like a lot of students do and confuse these with kittners, right? Or peanuts, those are for blunt dissection. These are cotinoids and they're used in neurosurgery, right? For craniotomies, uh, back surgery, uh, they're actually hemostasis kind of material, right? Sponges for neuro. Jumping right over here is a Taylor, Taylor spinal instrumentation look at it it's really big it's a handheld retracting device and used in a lot of back cases handheld retraction device the taylor can't really see it, the taylor spinal retractor come right over to this one here is next is called the myelin laminectomy retractor and just looking at the name laminectomy uh, this is a back case. We're in a prone position. It's a self-retaining type of retraction device. You can see how it has long extensions for that. Why is that? That muscle that runs bilateral on the sides of the spinal cord, really tough, right? Get a little bit deeper down in that excision and we're going to retract and help with exposure to the actual site we're working on typically for back cases, right? The spinous process, the transverse process, and eventually the lamina or whatever the case we're doing, right? The myelin self-retaining type of retraction device used in neuro cases. Next example is the cerebellar, is the cerebellar retractor, right? Commonly confused, confused a lot of the time with which self-retaining retractor? Yeah, you would think that was a Wheatlander, but no. It has that curve. They do come dull or sharp, just like a Wheatlander, but has a curved edge to it, opposed to where a Wheatlander is more straight. Why are we? Ha why do we have that curvedness on a lot of these retraction devices? As you make an, inc an incision in the back, right? We're in the supine and we do a midline incision for the back. It progressively gets a little bit deeper, right? You might start off with a Wheatlander, progressively make to a, cere a cerebellar type of retraction device, and maybe eventually get down to what they call the myelin, right? You can see how deeper that goes into the actual body itself. Good example of a couple of these self-retaining retraction device, the cerebellar. Next up here, we have the Beckman retracting device, or the Beckman retractor, right? Very large self-retaining retractor. You can see how large this thing is, right? Used in back cases, let's say we're doing T1 to T12, we're gonna have a pretty large uh, incisional site on that back, so we need some kind of large self-retaining retraction device. As you can see, the only difference is here is a lot of those edges have an articulation to it. They articulate up, 
whatever the case may be, it really is all about exposure to that incisional side itself. But the Beckman, largest of the self-retaining retracting device, has an articulation aspect to that edge, uh, but one of the larger, they do come sharp. When I say sharp or dull, those are the tips on the end there. Uh, just realize if you're around highly vascular areas, you don't want to have too much sharp. This is a dull version of that. Gelpy, Gelpy retraction device is very sharp, right? Again, is a, a thing that we can retract back to. It's going to be on really tough tissue, maybe some tough muscles. They want to help that retract uh, back. These are all self-retaining type of retraction device. Myerlin, Cerebellar, the Beckman, the Gelpy, right? We're going to jump right here on this bad boy here. This is a love a love nerve root retractor. Why do we need retraction devices? They come angled, they come more of a 90 degrees. Right, we isolate the nerves because the nerves run bilateral on the spinal cord or whatever the case may be. But if you're in the back, you can see it comes at an angle. We isolate that nerve and we protect it as we're working, right? This is a retracting device that really is just to isolate the nerve, retract back on that and make sure that it's protected in some aspect. We're looking over here, this is what they call the Cobb Elevator. It's kind of big. They also call it the Periostal Elevator, but in this case it's a Cobb Elevator. I think they kind of go hand in hand. Well, what are we using this for? In back cases, we're going back and pushing things to the side. We're scraping off osteophytes, periosteum, multi-use tool mainly for maybe helping the doctor get in there and retract back as they're trying to isolate things. Multi-use tool can be used in orthopedics a lot of the time, but elevators just by definition elevate or maybe scrape off periosteum, right? This funny looking thing here is a Hudson Brace handheld uh, drill, right? What is the proper name of it? It's a Hudson handheld drill. I also have seen it called a brace, right? This is a Hudson handheld drill. What do we use this drill for? Epidermal hematomas, right? Or any hematoma within the brain, we do something called burr holes. Kind of a primitive thing. I think there's more uh, pneumatic drills that probably substitute that. But for CS purposes, this handheld drill will drill burr holes, which is really just a hole within the cranium to relieve what? The pressure within the brain, the intracranial pressure, handheld drill called the Hudson. This strange looking device here, anytime neuro is in mind or in play, you want to have something that's going to fixate the actual head onto the bed. Many ways you can do that. And if you know the bed, it comes in three different parts, right? There's a leg, there's a body, there's a headrest. That headrest comes off. Something called the Mayfield headrest. This is the fixation part. Very sharp. Ouch. Very sharp on each side. This fixate the actual head in the proper position. It's not going anywhere. There's something called a horseshoe version of this Mayfield. It's more of a cushion. Not so traumatic with these fixation device. There's also something called a Gardner's tong traction device and that's with a weighted pulley system. Go ahead and look that up and see what those three things are. But the main fixation for the actual head itself during craniotomies, right? Or these Mayfield uh, positional devices or headrest, right? Fixation, horseshoe, or gardener's tongs, right? Going over a couple of these, uh, here we'll start here. This is called the Pinfields. Now it's in the Pinfield family, right? You have the free ear, Pinfield one, two, three, four. In this case, this is Pinfield four. These are dissectors. In back cases, uh, you can use these, an example, this is a freer. It's got, we use a Pinfield 4, very small, right? We're looking at this one here. This is a freer. It's in that same Pinfield, right? In that category, in that same family. They're all elevators or dissectors, but any kinds of Pinfields, you're in the back, right? You're trying to chip away on osteophytes. There's a different purpose of all these. Sometimes they're straight, sometimes they're small. But a common thing used, in my opinion, is this number four pin field dissector. So the question is on CST exam or any kind of exam, you say, what type of equipment would you use to help scrape up osteophytes? Pin field can be an option or curettes. But 
jump on over to the next one is a freer, right? You've all heard of freer elevators before. Believe it or not, they're dual purpose on each side. One's a little bit, see on their edge there, right on the edge there's one that's sharp on one side and there's a little bit, one's a little bit duller. There's two sides to that. Right, again, you can pick away at stuff, but obviously anyone that's in neuro, if you look on there, there's a little bit of what they call bone wax. You roll them up the balls. What is that for? If you nick the dura, what they call mechanical hemostasis, right? And it has that natural way of stopping the bleed. So if you nick that dura, typically you'll put some of that bone wax down, maybe some gel foam with some thrombin, and then follow it up with one of these bad boys, a cottonoid, right? This is called a freer and it has a little bit of bone wax. And if you look at bone wax, it comes in just like that. It's wax, right? Mechanical hemostasis. Bone wax. You just roll them up in the little balls, have them on the back of those freers so they can stop some bleeding. Look at a couple of these forceps. This is what they call a bayonet or a cushions bayonet forcep. Pretty much what the doctor is going to use a lot of the times. Passing over cotinoids. In my opinion, these cotinoids, they come in these little threads and pass it to the doctor, right? You pass the cottonoid to the doctor. This cushions bayonet forcep is used in a lot of these neuro cases. Don't confuse this. This is what they call a cushions bipolar forcep. It's a forcep, but if you look on here, bipolar, you know the difference between monopolar and bipolar. There's two, on a bipolar, there's two points of contact which electricity doesn't go through. It just goes to coagulation and it goes right to that other point of contact. Why is that important? Because you're working in delicate areas like the brain. We don't want electricity going through there to that dispersive pad or that bovi pad on a monopolar because that can give alternative burn sites and we don't want alternative burn sites within the brain. So a bipolar, otherwise known as a cushions bipolar forcep, is commonly used in a lot of neuro, maybe even some vascular areas too because it's obviously, like I just said, can be a problematic if there's other burn sites on a monopolar. Here's a dandy nerve hook. It's so dandy. Now, what is a nerve hook? Just like the love retractor, a dandy nerve hook is a little bit more fine where you can get in there and isolate nerves, push them back a little bit. Not much more to say about that, but that's the dandy nerve hook, okay? Looking over here, which is really important, this big bad boy here is a ronger. If you don't know what rongers are, you're shaping bone, right? This is what they call a luxel ronger, right? Grab onto that spinous process, tear out the spinous process. Kind of a heavy duty type of ronger. You're manipulating and reshaping bone or taking parts of bone out. Maybe in orthopedics, we're, push, we're taking off osteophytes those bony spurs that might be accumulating over time and become problematic. The Luxel, the Luxel Ranger. The Kerosene Ranger come in different sizes. One, two, three. They have a cut-in mechanism, which I would definitely, as a pro tip, make sure these are sharp. How do you check? You just check on papers that may be sterile on your field. Make sure they are working in order. Make sure this mechanism is working. But for CST purposes, if I said, if we're taking lamina on a laminectomy out of the actual patient, we're using a kerosen ronger. Is that written in stone? No, but for CST purposes, I want you to know that, right? The kerosen ronger come in different sizes. I would have a multiple sizes on my, my Mayo stand. And just make sure you let the doctor know which one you're giving them. He says, Ron, you want a kerosen ronger? You would give it to him, but make sure you specify it is a one kerosene because maybe he wants a two instead and he'll let you know. They've been multiple sizes. Next up is a what they call a cushions pituitary ranger. There's straight bite in, there's back bite in. What I mean about that is they can go forward, straight, or back. Why is that? If you're down in the body itself, it's awfully hard to try to manipulate if it's just one way. Sometimes you want something that's a little bit more back bite in or straight bite in. But for CST purposes, I want you to know if I take out disc fragments out of the back during a laminectomy or a discectomy of any kind, of, you're using a what they call a cushions pituitary ranger. For this case, the neuro, if you take disc fragment out, typically you'll use a pituitary ranger. They vary in sizes, small, large. There's something called a pea pod. I didn't name it. It really is. It's the pea pod, the smallest of the rangers, right? Again, straight biting, back biting, 
straightforward biting. Based on if you're in the anatomy itself, maybe you need something based on whatever you're looking at anatomy wise to try to reach. Okay, the pea pod orangier is the smallest of the actual pituitary orangiers. Okay, we're looking at this bad boy here. This is what they call a rainy clip applier, and it would have some rainy clips. I don't have that, but for test purposes, if I set a rainy clip or a rainy clip applier, which the clips go on to here, what is that used for? Something called a flap, a bone flap. So if you just picture the skull, we have to shave the hair off. Let's say we have a brain tumor, a hematoma, a dura hematoma, right? There's blood that's accumulated in the brain. We have to get those clots out because the pressure, the intracranial pressure is too much. So we have to shave off the hair. We make three little burr holes and we connect those dots with something called a pneumatic drill or a perforator. We take the flap off the brain. But just imagine we flip that part of the skin over, right? Just remember the skin on the actual cranium is highly vascular. It's gonna bleed a lot. So look it up, the rainy clips, rainy clip appliers, they go around the perimeter of those skin flaps. Two purposes, they hold the skin flap in place, but they control bleeding. So when you think of rainy clips, dual purposes mainly, mainly leading towards a hemostatic purpose, controlling the blood on the marginal regions, right? That's just an example of these neurology instruments or neuro instruments. A couple examples of those. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this video. Hey, go ahead and like this video, subscribe to this video. What are some uses? What are the names? Hey, do me a favor, like and subscribe if you like this type of content. Uh, it helps me with that algorithm. Put some questions in the comment sections. That helps me also if you have any questions about these instruments, especially if you're in class, right? Right. Our lab here at Port Charlotte is a very small example of what we do here. We, as you can see, our little patient on that table. Hey, go ahead and like this video. Subscribe to this channel if you want more content, if you want to see more content. But thank you for joining us. And obviously, hey, this is our example. If you ever want to see us here in Port Charlotte, come on down. We can give you a tour. We can show you a little bit about what we do here at Port Charlotte in the Southern Technical College, right? Thank you for watching, guys. Bye.